just really as a congregation together. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame in love. in the text, in the, in the uh, outline that you received. Psalm 88 is our text today. Imagine waking up in the middle of winter, having never experienced winter. Imagine living your whole life in some place where there never was a winter, you where you went from spring to summer to fall to spring to summer to fall to spring to summer to fall, and you've never seen winter. And suddenly, you know, you're thrust into not the beginning of winter, not where the leaves are starting to fall, and not where the temperatures are starting to grow cold, but imagine going to sleep in the middle of a July summer, that's all you've ever known, and waking up in the middle of a Vermont winter, maybe mid-February. How would, that, how would that impact you? You'd probably panic, right? 
it would, uh, it would freak me out. Like if I had no knowledge of winter and no sense of, of what, I, I, I would think that the, the apocalypse happened. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. I've never experienced cold, so the climate change people apparently were, you know, wrong to the polar opposite. You know, it's, it's a frozen Arctic now. I've never experienced barren trees. Where did the leaves go? And why are they on the ground? And why are they buried under this white stuff? And what is this white stuff? I would have never experienced the shortness of the days. Where'd the long days go? I mean, the sun set, you know, last night at 8.30 or 9, and, and, and now it's 4.30 and 5, and it's starting to get dark already. I've never experienced that kind of expanding darkness. And I could say at first I would panic. I'd kind of freak out. Uh, what's, what's really going on here? What's happened to my world? The second thing I would want to do is fix it. <laughs> how, do we, how do we repair this? What's wrong with the world? And how do we make it right again? How do we make the days long again? How do we, can we glue or staple the leaves back on the trees? Um, can, we, can we thaw everything out? Can we get a flamethrower and you know, melt everything? Can we warm the place back up? Can we lengthen the day? <clears throat> If I couldn't fix it or change it, I would want to escape it. I'd want to just, you know, get, get out of it. Like, how do I leave? How do I get out of this? Is there some other place where normal is? And yet, <clears throat> that would all be based on my frame of reference or my experience. And if you had grown up in Vermont and you had experienced a lifetime of the changes of seasons. In fact, how many of you, I'm just curious, how many of you in the room have grown up in environments where there are four distinct seasons, like there are here in Connecticut? This is just all you've ever known, okay? So, you know, imagine somebody from some, some a Caribbean island that's right near the equator, you know, suddenly being thrust into your world. And you're, this is normal for you. Like, you expect the leaves to change and fall, you expect the trees to go bare, and you expect the ground to freeze. You expect, in fact, you actually, and don't lie to me, I know, you actually want snow. Yeah, some of you do, okay? Some of you do. Uh, you look forward to, why? And I get it. I totally get it. I, we don't like to shovel it. We don't like to move it. But it makes things pretty at a time of year when most things are ugly, naturally speaking. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the, the environment, okay? You know, when most of the world is ugly, the snow is like beautiful, and it brightens things up at a time of year when darkness is pretty prevalent. So it, it lightens everything up as well. So yeah, you're normal. I mean, winter's normal to you. The transition into it, the duration of it, and then coming out of it. So it doesn't freak you out. You don't try to fix it. You don't try to escape it. Why? Because you understand it. And so rather than trying to escape it, you, you, you get through it. And you've discovered the art. In fact, you guys have done a great job of teaching me <laughs> the art of how to get through the winter. And so whenever we have friends that migrate to Connecticut or family that have migrated to Connecticut, so many people that we were trying to get away from just followed us. Um, <laughs> we still love them, but uh, just kidding. We, um, we weren't trying to get away from them, but uh, it's, awesome. it's awesome that we have family and friends here. But, but whenever a new family member migrates, we're like, okay, Ocean State Job Lot is your friend. You're going to need salt and snow shovels. You're going to need gloves. Uh, Costco, go to Costco in September, buy socks, buy layers, buy, you know, every Thursday, my day off, every Thursday, my first two years here, Dana would say, what do you want to do all winter long? I'd say, I want to go to Marshall's and buy more warm stuff, you know, it's something therapeutic about just buying another sweater that made me feel like I could survive. So you guys have done a great job teaching me, teaching our family how to navigate winter, how to get through it. And not only how to get through it, but really how to grow through it, how to enjoy it. Now, <clears throat> Psalm 88 is one of the best passages in Scripture. And there are many, by the way. In fact, there, is, there are truckloads of Scripture passages that teach us about winter seasons of life and how to navigate them. 
Um, we've established the fact in the last few weeks that existence, life, <clears throat> is seasonal. Just like the environment is seasonal, our lives are seasonal. And the same work that God does in rhythms, in nature, and in creation, that, si that similar work he does in rhythms in our lives, seasonally and rhythmically, God grows us, God shapes us, God changes us. It is common to be surrounded by normal rhythms that we are surprised by. It's common to be surprised by them, to fail to, to recognize how they build into from one season to the next and what one season is doing in preparation for the next. It's common, we've already established this, to feel insufficient for this season and unaware uh, and fearful of the next season. And yet we've said this, rhythms and seasons teach us to celebrate where we are while we're preparing for where we're going. And then everything kind of builds on this one. If I get this season right, I will savor its delight and be well prepared for the next season. And so we've laid all this groundwork about seasonality. And, and I haven't read you this, but Ecclesiastes 3, to everything there is a season. And a time to every purpose under heaven. Later in the passage, uh, Solomon writes, I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world or eternity or the sense of eternity in their hearts so that no man can really find out the work that God maketh from beginning to end. We can't understand all that God is doing, but we can be in the season he's led us into. We can understand that season and we can navigate that season by his principles and by his grace and get ready for the next one as well. And so before us today is winter. And what we're going to do over the next six to eight weeks is use the winter, spring, summer, fall metaphors to break down the seasons of life. And we're not talking about life stage or age brackets. Just eradicate that from your mind. I understand there's kind of this normal sense of you know, if you talk about the winter time of life, you think you're talking about your senior years. That's that's fine, that's good and fine, but that's not how I'm using this term. Because just like winters, if, if you've grown up with them, have come and gone your whole life, so they will come and go spiritually and emotionally and relationally, they will come and go throughout your whole life. And if you haven't experienced one, it may just shock you. It, it may, you may have this expectation that winter only happens to the faithless or the fearful or the, you know, the flawed, the people that just missed something, they didn't get it right. But in fact, no, winter is predictable, it's normal, it happens to everybody. It is a season that comes and goes and we should be expecting, we should be preparing and we shouldn't be knocked uh, completely into a, a tailspin, we shouldn't be knocked off course when winter arrives. We don't need to freak out. We don't need to totally lose our bearings. We need to navigate through it and let winter do its work. And so today we're going to talk, today's mostly diagnostic. We're going to talk about the woes of winter. Um, I want to try to give you an awareness of what is normal, that so many people who are on the journey of following Jesus don't think is normal. So when winter happens, it, it really knocks, it, it, it kicks them in the gut and, and it sucks the life out of their faith and sucks the hope out of their walk with the Lord. And they, if they're not careful, they get disillusioned or disappointed with God as though this didn't work. It would be very much like you waking up tomorrow morning and going, well, spring, summer, and fall sure didn't work because here it is again. In reality, we're right where we're supposed to be. It's January and 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 the seasons are happening and behaving normally for those who are aware of them. Author Mark Buchanan describes winter in life this way. And I want you to let the Spirit of God help you diagnose where you may be right now. And if you're not there, thank the Lord, praise the Lord, but it's coming, okay? And I don't know how it will show up. It's an external and an internal experience, but I want you to, nav I want you to hear the diagnostic. Winter is bleak and cold and dark and fruitless. The, you know, 
meteorological winter he's talking about. It's a time of forced inactivity, unwelcome brooding, more night than day. Most things are dead or appear so. It never seems to end. The assumption many of us labor beneath is this. When, when we think about winter and life or winter and our hearts and our, and our walk with God, the assumption many of us labor beneath is this. God can't be in winter. God, if I experience a winter spiritually, then God has abandoned me. Or maybe I have wandered from him. This bleakness, this fruitlessness can't be blessed by God. And this is where we go with this, and this is what I pray you will be set free from. This false accusation from Satan that goes like this, and it's in first person. If I loved God, or if God loved me, I wouldn't be here. If I was a better Christian, if I had just done, oh, the, the God's upset at me. He knows how I failed. He knows what I did. And this is just my punishment. This is how our minds, this is where our hearts go when winter comes into our lives. It's theologically completely wrong. It's biblically completely wrong. It's the wrong way to think. But Satan is the accuser. And he accuses you and he accuses God and he accuses God to you. And he wants to make you think you've done something wrong or God has abandoned you or God has stepped back into the shadows and taken his hand of blessing off of you because if, if you were right and he was right and he was good and you had done the right thing, then this wouldn't be happening. But nothing could be farther from the truth. Winter's normal, winter's to be expected. And winter has its woes. Now, winter also has its work and its wonder. But we're not going to get to the work and wonder this week. That's for next week. Today we're just going to break down. How do we know we're in winter and what is going on in winter? Now, let me, let me draw your attention to Psalm 88. And I want you to see the title of the psalm. In your Bible it says, A Song or Psalm for the Sons of Korah. Now, we've studied that before. These were the descendants of the people that rebelled against Moses, which is kind of a great story in and of itself because the people that rebelled against Moses back in uh, the early history of Israel were swallowed up, but not their kids. God spared their children, and their children grew up and became uh, generationally, over a long span of time, the worship leaders in the temple worship. So they became the worship team. They became the school of musicians. And so whenever you come to a song that's, that, that says it was written by the sons of Korah or for the sons of Korah, that's out of like the music school of Jerusalem that were led by these descendants of Korah. Well, this psalm was written by one of those sons of Korah, and you'll see his name at the end of the title there, Haman the Ezraite. Now, I don't have time to give you a long biography of Haman. We don't know a lot about him, but we know this, that Haman was a blessed man. He was a talented man. He's mentioned multiple times throughout Scripture. And generally, here's what you first need to know about the sons of Korah and about Haman And generally. Generally, the psalms they write are celebratory. I mean, they knew God on the mountaintops. They knew God on the great days. They knew God in the spring and summer seasons where everything was good and God was good and and they were sensing him and experiencing him and walking with him. And, and a lot of their psalms are high and wonderful and, and uh, encouraging and uplifting, celebratory. But not this one. In this psalm, Haman doesn't know where God went. And this is not an easy psalm to read. This is a brutal psalm. In this psalm, Haman is literally like yelling at God. He's screaming and crying and he's bitter and he's despondent and even accusatory. Winter has descended into Haman's life. One scholar calls this psalm an embarrassment to conventional faith. <laughs> A lot of believers would read this psalm and go, what is this even doing in the Bible? It just is so far off the map of our expectation of if I believe in Jesus and if I follow God, it's gonna be a long walk through spring and summer and everything will be good. 
And if I, if I go into a winter season, God's not in that, and I did something wrong, and something's broken. But here's Haman, a worship leader in the service of God, who typically writes from the mountaintop view, praising and thanking and celebrating God. But in this psalm, Haman is not experiencing God. We don't know the circumstances. We don't know what particularly was going on in this season. It's probably good that we don't because it leaves it, leaves it wide open for anytime we come into similar emotional or heart experience. But Psalm 88 gives voice to winter's woes. It turns agony into prayer. But not a gentle prayer. The psalm is not a cool, clinical, detached, dispassionate list of symptoms. It is an eruption. It is wild and raw. It's a diary of disappointment. It is a testimony of anguish. It's a howling man howling up to God from the grip of his heartache. And it teaches us a lot about God. It teaches us a lot about winter. Just the very fact that God would put this psalm in scripture means he understands winter and he understands the anguish of our hearts. Would you look at it with me? Uh, psalm 88, and it's 18 verses. Let's just read it and then we'll take the next few minutes and break it down for a minute, the experience. It starts, it sounds like it's gonna be a wonderful psalm. Oh Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry. So up to that point, you're thinking, this is a good thing. But it goes south from here. For my soul is full of troubles. Now just pause with me and just let that sink in for a minute. Do you ever just say to God, God, I'm in big trouble. I don't know what to do, God. I don't know where I am. I don't know what's going on. I'm in big trouble. Do you ever wake up and feel like Mike and Sully, the scene in Monsters, Inc., where they've been banished into winter? <laughs> and then they, I haven't watched that movie in years. Haley was a little girl. Don't they meet a friendly snowman that makes snow cones? Isn't that what happens? Come on, all the young moms are helping me out here. Yeah, okay. You know, Haman says, God, I am in big trouble. My soul is full of trouble and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I'm dying. I'm counted with them that go down into the pit and I, as a man that hath no strength. God, other people think I'm gonna die. They've written me off and I'm utterly weak. I've got nothing left. Free among the dead. <laughs> the, only, the only relief to me, the only freedom to me would be the grave. I just read this morning, ironically, just on the, on the way to church, I saw in the news feed on my phone um, that just a week or two ago, the CDC, the head of the CDC said now, and I have not read the article, I didn't have a chance to look it up, twice as many people are dying from suicide and overdoses as are dying from COVID. That there's been this massive explosion of despair. And, and I, I told our pastoral staff eight, not eight months ago, I said, this can't go on. You cannot isolate people and expect them to thrive. We were made for community. We were made for love and, and, and mutual support of one another, relationships. We are designed for it. We need it. It's, it's, it's like the water of our hearts. We, we need that connectivity. And so there is a, there's a massive portion of our population that is right here, right now. And, and, and they feel like the only freedom is among the dead, verse five. Like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, they're cut off from thy hand. Now, now, verse six, I want you to understand, he's speaking of his experience, and his experience is coming into a head-on collision with reality. His feelings don't match up with his theology. He says, Verse six, thou hast laid me in the lowest pit in the darkness in the deeps. God, you did this to me. I thought you were in charge. I thought you were in control. You feel him? Crying out, and I'm not talking about gently. That's an accusation. That's almost disrespectful. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me. 
God, this must be your anger. You must be really angry with me to let this be happening to me. Thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Selah, that's kind of a rest, a catch your breath part of the music, that word Selah. But God, your, your wrath and your affliction is coming over me, billow after billow after, I'm drowning in your oppression. Now, I want you to catch this. This is a man who is talking to God about his perception that God is oppressing him. Doesn't that, counter, doesn't that contradict every sense we would have of what faith and prayer would be about? Like, we, we, we don't filter faith through that negative harshness. And yet, this is faith on display. It's painful faith. He's not cursing God. He's yelling at him. To turn your back and walk away, I give up on you, God. I'm done with you. I'm out. That's faithlessness. But to turn and look up and say, what are you doing to me? Now that's faith. <laughs> it's a defiant, you know, confused, perplexed faith, but it, it is faith. He's doing the wrong thing the right way. Maybe that's the way to say it. Okay. <laughs> like if you're going to yell, yell at God. And your, and your spouse said, yes, yell at God. <laughs> you know what? God's the one that gave me to you, so it's his problem. It's his fault. Blame him. That, that truly is one of the takeaways of this psalm. If you need to yell, yell at God. That's how merciful and gracious he is. Because only God can re rewrite your emotions. Only God can write the perspective that brought you yelling and screaming into his presence. And grace has come boldly to the throne of grace, that you may find mercy to help in time of need. There, there is something about that bold access, and we always think of it in a positive way, but this is bold access too. He's boldly, to, you know, yelling at God. Where'd I leave off? Verse, uh, verse eight, thou hast put mine acquaintance far from me, and thou hast made me an abomination. I don't even have any friends. You've taken all my friends away. They don't want to have anything to do to, with me. I'm an abomination. The end of verse eight, I am shut up. I cannot come forth. I got nothing left. My heart is so closed, it'll never open again. Verse nine, my eye mourneth by reason of affliction. I can't stop crying. Lord, I've called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. We'll come back to that every day. I'm, I'm God. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee, Selah? Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave or thy faithfulness and destruction? It's kind of rhetorical. He's saying, God, if you kill me, can I praise you? What, what's the purpose here, God? What's the end game? I, I thought I was designed to give you glory. Am I going to glorify you by, by, by you, you killing me and burying me? And Old Testament saints have had a very different view of, of afterlife than we do. We, we have the whole narrative. There was a lot more question to it to them um, and, and a lot more uncertainty about what was after the grave. There's hints that they could have understood it, but not, certainly not as we do. They, they never heard Jesus say, I'm going to prepare a place for you. They never heard the Apostle Paul write that we are waiting for the return of Jesus and, and where we be brought into his kingdom and glory. So we've got... We've got a three-dimensional, full-color view, high-definition view of our future where they didn't so much. And so he's really desperate. Verse 12, shall thy wonders be known in the dark and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness. Verse 13, but look at the relentless faith here. But unto thee have I cried. O oh Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent. That's, we use that word differently today. It's my prayer will meet you. My prayer will be right there in the morning. Count on it, God. Think about this man now. God, you've oppressed me. God, you've disrupted me. God, you've, you've, you're, I'm nearly dead. But if I wake up tomorrow, my prayer's going up. I'm not giving up. 
You're going to find my prayer in the morning. Look at verse 14. Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? You see, he believes in God, but he's not experiencing him. He knows God is there, but he's not feeling him. (laughs) He doesn't have a sense that he's hearing and responding to him. That's where I say his theology is coming into a head-on collision with his real-life experience. This is winter. This is really common. If you're going to follow God, this experience is a part of the journey, a recurring part of the journey. Verse 15, I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth. Do you, I want you to catch this. At this point, what he's saying is, my life has been miserable since I was born. Like every day, his present reality is so pervasive, he can't remember when it was any better. That's how deep and dark this season was for this man. Now, surely his life wasn't winter all the way from his childhood, okay? But that's his sense of it. That's his feeling of it, is there's never been anything any better than this darkness for me. I'm afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about together. I'm just boxed in. I'm surrounded and I'm wrapped up. I'm tied up. God, I can't get out. I can't escape. Verse 18, lover and friend, how thou hast, hast thou put far from me. I've got nobody. And mine acquaintance into darkness. And the sense of that phrase, mine acquaintance in, into darkness, you've turned darkness into my friend. Uh, darkness is my best friend. Darkness is my only friend. My closest friend is darkness. He talks about darkness three times in the psalm. Now, you guys ready to go home? (laughs) Aren't you glad you came to church? Wow, what a miserable... Here's what's amazing about this psalm. It just drops you off the edge of the cliff and leaves you there. There's only two psalms that do that. I think the other one is Psalm 39. Most of the psalms, they go through a valley of darkness, but they come out. God came through. God saved me. I was this, but look, God God helped me. But not this psalm and not Psalm 39. They just kind of linger and leave you there. So what can we learn about the normal of winter? And I really, I pray that moving forward now into the message, we're still gonna talk about the negative experiences and and don't give up on me in the series because we still got spring, summer, and fall and we still got the good stuff of winter to get to next week, okay? If, If I could just do one thing today, it would be, When you go through winter, don't freak out. Don't try to fix it. Don't try to run from it. Don't try to get out of it. Get through it. Grow through it. Prepare for it, just like you do every winter. Because God does some wonderful things in winter. But the experience, I want to break it down for you. And I documented in my outline five experiences. Many of them we've talked about, but let's just document them now. Number one is darkness. It's the absence of light. So three times, verse 6, 12, and 18, And the sense in Haman at this moment, not his reality, okay? If you don't hear anything else, hear me on this one. This is not objective reality. Haman's going to come out of this. He's going to survive this. He's going to write future psalms celebrating God. But it is right now his experience. It is his sense. And he is surrounded by darkness. And this darkness feels never-ending, it feels consuming. It seems like a night that will never end, and it seems like a night that is all he's ever known. He's lost his way. He's lost perspective of what his life used to be or where it's going. He's just lost in the darkness. The last word of the psalm in the in the in the uh, Hebrew phrasing, when you look at it as it was written, the last word is darkness. I'm surrounded by darkness. I can't escape the darkness. And what we get the sense of is it's a long darkness. It's a it's a it feels absolute. It feels unrelenting. He asks, "Can your wonders be known in the dark?" In verse twelve, and he says, "The darkness is." 
is my acquaintance, my friend. It's, it's, it's the only place I can find any relief, just collapse and go to sleep and try to sleep it off. But Spurgeon said, while a man can see God as his Savior, and this man is seeing him, he starts the psalm with, um, God of my salvation. Spurgeon says, while a man can see God as his Savior, it is not altogether midnight with that man. So darkness, pervasive, long-lasting. One of the takeaways here is you lose perspective in the dark. You really don't know where you are. And you get disoriented in the dark. You, you, you can, um, it feels forever. If, if, if you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, the tunnel feels like it goes on forever. And you can begin believing that, it, that this is the end, that this is all there is, and that you won't come out of this. What we're, experiencing, what we're talking about in this psalm is very akin to depression and probably is related to it and in some form similar or the same. I'm, I'm not a, a, a therapist or a doctor to diagnose that. I'm, saying, I'm simply talking to the experience that is a normal part of following God. So darkness is the absence of light. The second diagnostic is emptiness. The, the absence, I'm sorry, the absence of light, the absence of God, emptiness. In verse three, Haman says, my soul is full of troubles. All the blessing, all the energy, all the strength has, has dissipated. He says in the end of verse four, I'm as a man that hath no strength. I'm empty. I, I'm exhausted. I'm depleted. I got nothing left. I, I, I'm not going to explore all the times I've been in winter. I'll just tell you uh, over, uh, let's see, I'm almost 52, so 40 four years of following Jesus, lots of winter seasons for lots of reasons, uh, lots of contributing factors. Um, by the way, this, this experience is both internal and external, and so is the darkness experience and the emptiness experience. It's, there, there can be an external darkness that uh, the circumstances have created, but there can be this internal sense of where is God and where am I? And and this internal sense of, of, is God still engaged with my life? Um, I, I can't tell you the number of times that you, you, you hit empty. I've hit empty just in my own heart or emotions or spirit. And I'm not sure I can untangle all that you know, accurately, but you just hit bottom where you don't, want, you don't want to live for the Lord. You don't want to pray or read the Bible. You don't want to go to church. You don't even want to be around people, which we'll see that in a minute. You don't have anything to give. You don't have anything to bring to those environments. You're empty. And that's how Haman feels right now. So there's the emptiness. Winter hides God. It severs what I know about him from what I'm experiencing of him. My faith and my reality come into conflict. And what wants, this is important about the emptiness, what once energized me and brought delight doesn't anymore. It's like that place in Ecclesiastes where he says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth uh, when before the days come when you have no pleasure in them. It's, it, there's, there are seasons where what once gave me pleasure doesn't anymore. I don't find the same joy or the same energy or the same motivation where I found it before. Now, these are not permanent things. If you're not hearing anything else, remember season. There's a rhythm to this. I wish I could do next week's message right now. Um, the psalmist believes in God, but he's lost any sense of him. He's lost any experience of him. He talks about the God of salvation, but his experience is that God is rejecting him or that God is at best indifferent to him. So you talk to me. Has he... Has God become indifferent to this man? Yes or no? Absolutely not, 1,000%. Has he lost his salvation? Yes or no? No. Has God gone anywhere? Yes or no? No. But he's in the dark. And so he can't see it. He's lost the sense of it. Okay. Third thing that we diagnose from this psalm is loneliness. The absence of friends. And by the way, sometimes we are tempted to accentuate this or to exacerbate this. Why? Because we take our 
feelings of darkness and emptiness, and we recluse, and we withdraw from those we need to be around and draw from. We withdraw from them, and we are tempted to nurse our sadness with aloneness. I just want to be by myself. Just leave me alone, which is a it's a self, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a spiral down is what it is. It's a, it, it, it's a, it starts a, a cycle that is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's only going to make my situation worse. But the psalmist says in verse 8, you've put all of my acquaintance far from me. God, I used to have friends. I used to have close relationships, and I don't have any right now. I'm alone. They, I'm an ab- they don't want anything to do with me. I'm an abomination to them. The last verse, lover and friend hast thou put, I've lost those that loved me, I don't, I don't have a, a spouse, I don't have anybody, um, I'm totally alone. Author Mark Buchanan writes, this is the shape of the soul in winter. It feels friendless. It feels this way even maybe most in a crowd. Have you ever come to church and felt alone? Don't raise your hand. I imagine... Most of us have felt that. Have you ever gone to a family gathering or a, you know, a, a group thing and, and, or, or gone to where there's lots of people, but you feel, you still feel alone? Welcome to winter. That's a very real winter experience. The number four thing that I diagnosed from this psalm in the experience of winter is lifelessness. And what I mean by this is the absence of vitality. Look at verse eight. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I've stretched out my hands unto thee. That phrase, I'm shut up, I can't come forth, is I, I, my heart is so closed, I can't get it to open back up. I can't find any strength or anything to bring to the table. He says again, verses three and four, we already talked about it. I'm nearly a dead man. And this is what winter can feel like. It can feel like a living death. Think about the view as we we walk out of this building this morning. The trees, do they look alive or dead? They look dead, don't they? Are they? And that's where the deception of winter can eat us alive. We think our faith is dead. We think God has turned his back. We think we've done something wrong. We think our faith has failed us somehow or God didn't come through or maybe, maybe, just maybe he doesn't even exist. Maybe this was all just a big delusion and he isn't even there. This is what goes on in our minds. In reality, those trees are not dead. They're very much alive. They look dead. (laughs) The experience is, for us, they're dead. How can they survive? They're designed to survive it. In fact, don't we know, and this is just a little prelude for next week, don't we know that pretty much everything that's gonna happen to those trees in spring and summer and fall is beginning right now? Yes or no? Oh yeah. That that snowfall, that frozen ground, these cold stormy days, these short days, those, those trees Something is happening in them that we can't see. But in a few months, we're going to see it. In vibrant spring, explosive color, it's going to come back to life. And then, a couple more months, we're going to see it. We're going to taste it. We're going to be picking it and eating it and baking pies with it. I have the ministry of taste testing. I'm in charge of that ministry at the church. Okay, So, Yeah, they look dead. The experience is winter is a living death, but no, they are not dead, not in the least. And neither are you. And neither is your faith, and neither is your God, and neither is your Savior, Jesus. It's not, any of it is dead. You might be in darkness. You might feel friendless, lonely. You might feel empty, strengthless. You might feel the loss of life and vitality. You might think my heart is so closed, my, my faith is so dead, my attitude is so bad, it will never recover. But you're wrong. You will. You can't fix winter. You can't escape winter. You don't want to do anything foolish or stupid or destructive in winter. 
We want to get through it because good things are happening in winter. But that's not the experience. Winter, winter shames us. It makes us feel like failures. Like we try to look for what, what we did to cause this. Again, it would be like you waking up tomorrow and not ever experiencing a winter, you and your spouse waking up, and I can imagine looking at Dana going, what did you do? Like all the leaves are off the trees. What did you do? She would say, it's not me, it's you. It's that blower I got you. You know, you must have done this. You, you'll try to figure out the cause and find a solution instead of stewarding the season and letting the season prepare you for the next and even enjoying the season. And I can't wait to get that, that part. There's actually a lot of things we can enjoy about winter. I'll give you a little prelude to next week. Skis only ski on snow. Skates only skate on ice, right? That's just a little bit about next week, all right? But we're sure it's our fault. We wonder what we've done. Number five, and, and, and finally, hopelessness. And that, I just wrote that down as the absence of expectation. This is the horrible feeling that there's no way out. There's no escape. Like this is the new forever. I'm here, I'm stuck forever. And this is why suicide is on the rise and mark it down, it will continue to rise. Unless the circumstances change, unless society reopens, unless uh, there's a, a relief from COVID and from the fears that are surrounding us, lots of people will come to the despair of, I can't do this. There's no way out of this except for death. Look what he says, God, verse 10, God, you're gonna show your wonders to the dead? Um, can, can I praise you from the grave? Can I show your, verse 15, I'm afflicted and ready to die for my youth. I suffer the terrors. I'm distracted. I can't get out of this. I can't, I'm stuck. The whole psalm has this stuckness to it. He's praying, but he's not controlling his emotions. He's cross-examining God, and he's viewing his whole life through his present darkness and he just can't see a way out. So I want you to look back at this terrible, terrible list. And I hope you don't go out and go, I am never going back to that church. That was the most depressing service I ever sat through. There is real joy to be had in winter. But, but listen, my mission is not just to bring you in and make you feel good. My mission is to give you the information you need to navigate this life and God's rhythms his way. And winter is his doing. And it doesn't need to wreck your faith. It doesn't need to wreck your life or your family. It doesn't need to be fixed. Hopelessness is that feeling that I can't get out of it. But look at these five words again and reckon with them. For some in the sound of my voice, I have no doubt just hearing these words has given you a fresh reorientation that, you, that has relieved you. No, you're not stuck in darkness forever, but yeah, reckon with the darkness. It is real. Darkness, emptiness. Are you gonna be empty forever? No, but do you feel it now? And is it real now? Yes. But is it gonna be forever? No. Emptiness. Thirdly, loneliness. Do you feel alone, even in a crowd? Maybe. Are you alone? No, you are not. And, and one of the ways through winter is knowing this isn't, this isn't forever. It's not going to be 30 degrees forever in Connecticut. It's, these trees are not going to be barren forever. We know there's an end. We know there's an expectation. And so we can work through it. We can grow through it. Loneliness, lifelessness. Are, you feel it? You feel like it's a walking death through winter? Sure you do. Is that a real perception? No. Is that, does that represent an absolute? Does it represent an objective reality? No. It's a feeling. It's an experience. But your faith stands, and truth is still true, and God is still God. And this is what is so strong about the psalmist. He knew to bring his experience to God. And he knew in spite of what he was experiencing, God was bigger than all of that. And he knew the only way to navigate it was to bring it to God. Lifelessness, hopelessness. 
So I bring you to this statement, and I'm just gonna keep coming back to this statement. Jesus is the Savior for all seasons. He created winter. He knows winter. He understands winter. He's gonna get you through winter. And I wanna just share with you, I put more in your outline, but I wanna share with you just some, some promises of God about darkness. Isaiah 29 God says that I'm going to open the eyes of the blind and let you see out of obscurity and out of darkness. In Isaiah 42, he says that Messiah, his servant, will, will open blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. So God knows you're in winter right now. God knows when you're in darkness, and his plan is bring you through it, bring you out of it. Isaiah 50, who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that would be Jesus, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Now, I want you to just reckon with that phrase for a minute. You fear God, you're an obedient believer, but you walk in darkness and have no light. Now, we would not put that together. Again, our theology typically thinks if I'm obeying God and fearing God, it's going to be all a walk in the light. And God says, no, 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 no. There's going to be some times where you're doing everything right and you're walking through darkness. And you're going to be like, what did I do wrong? Let him, Isaiah 50, let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. No, expect winter, understand winter, doesn't mean you've done anything wrong, and stay on God, trust in God. But here's the real key about Jesus being the Savior for all seasons. Matthew 27, 45, Jesus was on the cross. While Jesus is on the cross, bearing in his body your sins and mine, what did he do? Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Haman, Psalm 88, had temporary darkness, superficial darkness, but Jesus went into real darkness. Your winter, temporary darkness, superficial darkness, mostly emotional, psychological, walking through the dark. It's totally disorienting. It's totally uh, consuming. It feels comprehensive, but Jesus went into real darkness, real wrath, faced utter rejection. Why? For you and for me. He took ultimate darkness so that your darkness and my darkness would just only be temporary, so that it would only be seasonal. I love what Tim Keller says about this. He says, if Jesus didn't abandon you in his own darkness, why would he abandon you in yours? He entered this darkness for you. There's no darkness through which he hasn't gone for you. There's no darkness in which he won't meet you and walk with you. And there's no darkness that can perpetually forever hide him. There's no darkness that he won't in time lead you out of. He, he not darkness, he is your closest friend. Look at verse 10, Psalm 88, verse 10. Last verse and we're done. You guys with me? I hope I didn't crush you today. Rhetorical question. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? And then this little word, Selah, there's this interesting, poignant little break right there. The psalmist is almost accusing and almost sarcastically saying, what, God, you're gonna raise the dead? I'm going to die. What, are you going to raise me so I can rejoice and praise you? And then he's got this little pause, this pregnant pause. And you know what the answer to the question is? Help me out. What's the answer to the question of verse 10? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to raise the dead. And I'm going to take you from death to life. So yeah, God says, I will bring you out of darkness. I will raise you from death. It happens first at salvation, the moment you trust what Jesus did for you. But then it happens really every time you go through a winter. You can expect, you can expect winter, but you're all great at winter 
okay? You're all really great. Take everything you know about Connecticut winter, grab it by a leash, and drag it into your spiritual life and apply it all spiritually. You don't fix it. You don't get out of it. You didn't do anything to create it. It just is. Next week, we're going to find out why it is. What's the work that we have to do in winter that God does, and what are the wonders? So bear with me, okay? If today was oppressive, next week will be relief, okay? Let's pray. Have our heads bowed, would you? Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this raw, honest psalm. I pray that your spirit has spoken uh, more clearly than I ever could have. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're a believer, I think the response today, if you're not in winter, the response today would be, God, let this be preparatory. Let this be preemptive. Let this be my, my uh, graduate class for when winter arrives. But if you are in winter, I hope today has been a pressure release valve. I hope today has let off that sense of absolute despair or hopelessness. Or bad theology. What did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong? Why is God letting me down? You take a minute to respond to God. And if you are not a believer, if you don't know that you've trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, he died for you and he's ready and willing to come into your life right now. How do you make that happen? By faith. It's called repentance. You believe and you receive. And in prayer, sincerely from your heart, you can call on the name of the Lord, and he says, you will be saved. You shall be saved. And so wherever you are, friend, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, would you invite him into your life right now? Something like this. Jesus, I admit that I am sinful and guilty and flawed. I fall far short of your righteous, perfect demands. And I believe that you came into darkness for me and you died on the cross for me and rose again for me. And I want that death, that atoning sacrifice to be applied to my account, to my failures. So Jesus, come into my life and be my savior. I'm trusting you as my personal savior. Now friend, if that's your prayer this morning, we have a gift bag in the back for you that has a Bible and a book. It's our gift to you. And if you're online, we will mail this to you. We simply need to know about your decision. So if you're online, email me, pastor at ebcnewington.com. Just say, Pastor Kerry, I prayed with you and I meant it. And we'll be happy to reconnect with you and send you this. If you're in the room and this is your decision today, please get this book and this Bible and take it as our congratulations on this important decision. And my friends that are in winter, you're going to get through winter. Stay on the Lord. Trust him. He's going to lead you through the dark. God, bless the rest of our services today. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.